first option. So our first presenter of the second session is <clears throat> Jerzy Vnucek. Jerzy studied conservation in Prague in 1992 to 93. He was an intern with Christopher Clarkson at Westin College, England. In 2010, he received a master's degree in conservation in Copenhagen, Denmark. In 2019, he completed his PhD in interdisciplinary research, which was focused on the visual assessment of parchment in medieval manuscripts at the University of York, Center of Medieval Studies and the Department of Archaeology in England. Specializing in conservation of parchment manuscripts and book bindings, he participated in the EU project EDAP, Improved Damage, Damage Analysis of Parchment, and several other research projects in the field of conservation of parchment manuscripts. His research includes experimental parchment making and the production of manuscripts in which he gives workshops, lectures, and publishes art articles. Most recently, he is participating in the EU research project Beast to Craft that is using biocodicology as a new approach to the study of parchment manuscripts. For JPC's volume, he offered a piece on the parchment of the Codex Amiatinus in the co context of manuscript production in Northumbria around the end of the 17th century. Identification of the animal species and the methods of manufacture of the parchment as clues to the old narrative. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great honor. And uh, I would very much uh, like to thanks to all the editors and everyone I was torturing with my texts. And uh, as you could uh, hear the title, it's rather long. And uh, I was so lucky also to have a rather long history with Chris and uh, I have met him a long time ago and I very often remember him, of course. And uh, I would like to start um, with my memories to some of his talks, uh, specifically uh, about, of course, early binding structure. At that time, we were all very much excited about his knowledge uh, about this. And uh, he, he shows us these two slides, which I really like. And on the top, there is the image of the mosaic from Ravenna, uh, uh, where you can see the old Amarium and uh, uh, some codexes lying there. And of course, um, St. Vavrensius, who is holding the book with a very special uh, way of tidying uh, up uh, of the binding. At that point also, Chris, this is the fifth century mosaic and Chris, of course, show us also the, the, the image underneath, which is uh, uh, from Codex Amiatinus, which shows the Ezra Cassiodorus in front of his library. And uh, again, we mostly focused on uh, bindings uh, either although some of those were hardly visible uh, both on the mosaic and, and uh, I add the Chris uh, image of the Chris uh, with his a very I would say typical smile uh, which he always used when he said some kind of joke during the talks and uh, you could see he was always kind of waiting for the reaction of the audience uh, and wondering if they get the joke correctly but uh, I would love to really say all kinds of stories and show more pictures of Chris, but I have to go on with my talk because um, it's about the Codex Amiatinus. And uh, uh, so I would like just in a very briefly say that it's a manuscript which was written in Northumbria uh, in Vermouth Jaro Scriptorium and uh, uh, around the turn of 7th and 8th century. And it's actually one of the three large Bibles which were commissioned by Abbot Selioth. And uh, until now, oldest complete Vulgate translation, which remains still in one pandek, it means one volume. Now, the, the Abbot Selioth left Nontrumbia with the Codex as a gift to the Pope 
And uh, in 716, so that's the latest date when the codex could be finished. But of course, because of the size, uh, it's expected that it was several takes several years uh, to be produced, especially because there were not only one volume, but three volumes uh, made. Now, the name of the Ameatinus actually come from the Mount Ameata in uh, Tuscany, where the codex was located before, uh, was monastery uh, of San San Vadore uh, suppressed, and uh, the book was moved to the Laurenziana, where it's still now. This book, as I mentioned, uh, exists and it's uh, preserved. However, from the other two codices, so called Selfred Bibles, there are only a few folios left and they're all kept now at the British Library. So here we have the most famous illumination of the Codex Amiatinus, uh, which I already described, but it's uh, quite important to mention that on the left side of the image, you can see the dedication text, which Selfred uh, written or asked to be written uh, in the, in, in the verso, the first folio. However, you can immediately notice that there was this forgery made and the text was alternated. So his name has disappeared and suddenly there was a different donor of the codex. And that's probably the major reason why this codex, when he was found or known in, in Italy, was actually considered to be written in Italy. And that uh, was, of course, one of my major interest in the research because uh, uh, this is supposed to be insular manuscript. However, it uh, have all kinds of romanizing uh, signs. So I was wondering about the type of his parchment which was used. <clears throat> you can see the codex is rather gigantic. I'm not a very small person and I have to say this is not from COVID time, uh, although I'm wearing the mask because um, I'm always trying to protect manuscripts, not myself. And so I better use it. And you can see uh, the dimensions here written and also the size of the codex, which is really huge. And as I said already, it's a one volume uh, Bible. That means the both the Old and New Testament together the oldest preserved. Now, as I'm going to talk about the parchment, I should briefly uh, say uh, something about uh, the, how was uh, um, parchment uh, found or recognized. And at the time of uh, when it was still considered the Italian manuscript, uh, actually the first Paul de la Garde considered that it's a very strange parchment for the uh, Italian manuscript. And he considered that the volume is very close to the manuscripts from Carolingian age. And of course, then we have some more uh, notes. Uh, I would specifically like to ask uh, the, uh, uh, sorry, mention uh, uh, the article of the Jarrow lecture from Bruce Mitford, who is, who mentioned that the manuscript was written on calf uh, parchment vellum and that 515 calves were need to be used for the production of such a codex. Surprisingly, or maybe not, Bernard Bishop has informed us in, a, in the Latin palaeography that uh, the Codex Amiatinus is actually written on sheep parchment. And uh, the last uh, note I have for you is that, in fact, quite sadly, when the Codex was disbound and digitized, there was not made any identification of the type of the parchment, although it was actually planned. So now very briefly, the goals of my presentation, I'm going to tell you about the visual observation of parchment I'm using. And it's a very complex activity. It doesn't mean only the identification of the hair follicle pattern, but the other characteristics. And of course, the study of the method of the parchment manufacture 
and importantly, also anatomy of the animal or skin itself. And I will briefly also talk about the way how the formation of the choir was made. Right, and I will start immediately with the first identification of the sheep. I mean, sheep was considered already by the bishop. And uh, of course, before I dared to ask uh, Bibliotheca Laurentiana for permission to study the original, I spent many, many hours studying the digital version, which is available on their website. And I could say that although uh, of course, um, the, the quality of the digitized book is mostly meant for to be read. I could still be able, I was still able to recognize that there is definitely sheep parchment involved. And uh, when I arrived to Florence, uh, I, I immediately start, I had already my notes and on every folio and I immediately recognized I was right, and the bishop as well, of course, uh, that uh, sheep parchment is uh, quite uh, on many folia. So uh, now it's important to mention the how was sheep parchment made. And that's rather interesting because it was made in a very special uh, technique, which I like to call the late antique parchment making process. Uh, which means that uh, parchment was actually peeled uh, from the hair side. You can see here on this image that the parchment is extremely thin. This one is smaller uh, size. So it shows nicely how it reacts uh, with the humidity. Uh, this is the only fragment of original Italian parchment uh, and manuscript, which is kept in England uh, from uh, Vermouth Jarrow. And it's a very small one, but it's definitely sheep. And uh, uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> as you can see, written in uh, Italian uncial, which was actually copied uh, by the English scribes. So, so right from the beginning, they were uh, trying to kind of reproduce the Italian way. Now here, very briefly, the technique of the making of such a parchment. You can see I'm peeling the epidermis and then I'm cleaning the papillary region, which makes a very nice uh, uh, surface. However, as you can see here, at that point on the right uh, left uh, lower corner, you can see the leftovers. And this is exactly what you can also see on some of the uh, uh, margins of the codex. And that means uh, kind of imperfections uh, which were left and which are kind of eye opener about the way how the parchment was prepared. The second type of parchment is a goat parchment. I was, of course, looking for the calf parchment. And trust me, uh, the first day I almost cried because in the evening, because after the whole day, I was just like, what is this parchment? This is not a calf parchment. I was so much hesitating. And uh, then, of course, I realized it's clearly goat parchment. And uh, uh, you can see actually here, uh, that the, there is a spine of the animal and a very well visible hair follicle pattern. Now, as it comes to the methods, you can see here a very interesting uh, image, which actually shows that the, the goat parchment for the Codex Amiatinus was prepared in the way how the calf parchment was made. It means it was only send it down when the when the pounds down, when the parchment dry out and only on the hair side. And so the, actually both sides. So, so actually both sides are equal like a calf parchment. The problem with the goat parchment is however, that it's much thinner than calf. 
and it's impossible to make it even. And so you have all these irregularities in the places like this, where is the flay cat, and you can still see the leftovers of the hair follicle pattern of the root. As it comes Sorry, to the you're, you're one more minute, huh? Okay, formation of the choirs, you can see uh, uh, the skins were orientated uh, horizontally and vertically. Most of the scholars thought it's just one skin per bifolium. I found out that some of the skins were much larger and it was possible actually to make two skins. So the number of animals is actually not precise. And I can prove it because I can recognize on the uh, 4-H uh, the, mm, uh, the belly of the animal, which clearly shows that it's a horizontal or vertical orientation. I have made this scheme uh, of the choirs, which also include the information about the orientation of the mm, choirs of the skins. to the observation of the animal skin. And uh, there is a very special thing we have found together with my colleagues, veterinarians, that it seems that these goats were actually uh, affected by the goat pox. And it apparently was the epidemic because the most of the skins there is one even more strange thing which can be recognized on the skin. And these are these parallel symmetrical scar tissues, which actually uh, are kind of mystery. And however, it might happen that the, some of the animals which have these calluses were used for the uh, chariots or different wagons because uh, it's exactly the place on their tights where the calluses are. Okay, so now very briefly at the end, the British Library, uh, which has the fragments only. This is the Greenville leaf. I was lucky that uh, I could, uh, with the help of Christina Duffy, uh, make the, this some uh, micro photos, which shows actually it's a cow parchment. And uh, when I studied in transmitted light, uh, the, the, the anatomy of the animal, it again shows clearly calf parchment. And even the, the one which was found by Nicholas Pickford and uh, at, at the library of the National Trust, when I look at this uh, in transmitted light, I found clearly it's um, uh, calf parchment and I would work well, because it's smaller than the, the, the normal size folio, I could even find out the, the probable original size of the skin and the animal. Right, the very brief conclusions, uh, there is no calf parchment, uh, as I mentioned, the goat and sheep. However, the sheep is made from different type of breeds, most probably also including the hair sheep. And as I mentioned, the goat uh, parchment is made like a calf. But the most important thing, there is no archaeological evidence in the whole North Cumbria, uh, and of course also not in Jaro, about any uh, goat bones assembled. So, assembled. so that means that we don't know where these goats come from. And I have a theory that some of these parchments might be produced actually in Italy or continent, or perhaps the, 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 the technology have to be transferred to Nontumbia, which I think it's rather difficult to imagine because it's rather special technique. And in the end, I would say, as I already mentioned that the whole codex was made actually to look like as Italian what is a really clear statement because it was intended as a gift for Pope to show the possibilities of this English scriptorium in the end of the world as the cell of the Britain. So I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Yerji. Quite an impressive codex.
And I know I can see that there is one question here from Sean Doherty. I don't know if this is pronounced properly. And I can go ahead and um, read it. This is uh, to Yerji. I don't know, Yerji, if you have you if you see this. Yes, or I have read it. Um, do you want me to read it so that the attendees can hear it too? So in your article, you say that the goat parchment is very homogenous, typical of animals of a similar age, breed, and size. This suggests they were drawing upon a sizable flock with animals killed at similar times. Goat bones are rarely recovered from contemporary archaeological sites in Northumberland, although distinguishing them from sheep is challenging. However, however their bones and skins are more common in Southern Europe. Noting the strong influence of Italian manuscripts on its production and it is not containing and it not containing vellum like other insular manuscripts. To what extent do you think Codex Amiatinos may not have been manufactured in England? Right. I will start from the end, uh, which is actually the question. And uh, there is no doubt this manuscript was manufactured in England. But as I was trying to stress, uh, it was made to look like. Italian on purpose. And uh, they did all efforts, starting with the writing, with the paleography, with, uh, sorry, with the inscription, decoration, everything to show Pope that this monastery, which had a very lively contact with Italy, actually, they were importing all kinds of artifacts, including also uh, the visitors and uh, from Italy. Uh, so that was the gift to thank the Pope and tell him we can do it as well. So that's quite clear. The other thing is, of course, the question of the goat bones and, uh, but I think it was no problem eventually to transport the finished skins from the continent. It needn't have to be actually Italy, it could be South France, for example, uh, to, to Britain and uh, do it there. Uh, yeah. So yes, of course, it's a problem with the uh, archeological excavation that the goat bones and the sheep bones are difficult to recognize, but uh, I don't know if I have properly answered that. Thank you, Yoshi. 